Hey everybody, my name is Jin. Hi everyone, I'm Chantel and we're sophomores here at UCSB. Go Tritons! So right now we're at Hilton Torrey Pines where we have our weekly Sunday services. And there's an awesome view of the ocean. And we've even had our baptism right out here during Easter. So before we get into our last installment of the next Sunday service series, some of us just want to share kind of what we've gotten out of the messages so far. All right, let's hear it. I thought Joe's message was really timely because the seniors are hosting a retreat for our friends this coming weekend. Most of my friends are atheists or agnostic, and I simply just did not feel qualified to do it. But one thing that really struck me was God's commission to me, how it was based on His authority and not my own. And knowing this made me feel more emboldened to not only invite my friends, but also spiritually connect with them as well. Hearing Philip go wherever he was called to really inspired me to become a person who's available to go wherever God calls me to, even if that place is like a desert. He had already decided in his heart to go where God called him to. A takeaway I had from the second message was that we should reaffirm our convictions through prayer. This made me realize that I was often praying to, for God to change my circumstances when instead I should be asking Him to strengthen my heart. Because with each trial comes with perseverance and an opportunity to hold on to God more tightly. All right, thanks everyone for sharing. Now, John Co. from our San Diego church will be giving us the message. So come on, let's go inside. Hold fast to what is true. If 
The cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life If I join you in your suffering Then I join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be Walk away, I know deep in my soul that I could quit And maybe I should I've done more than enough Now it's too hard and risky, I'm unfit There's no shame in that There are so many more I'll let someone else take this Maybe that's true I am tired, afraid, fermented, stressed out I'm a mess today I wish that my strength was as bold as it was back in yesterday Why does a life of faith come with so much difficulty? But if my journey ends here, I'd forsake those before me. Don't think about them. I should think about me. What I need matters most in the end. No, I won't be a fool. I'll heed good advice and go back to my life. I dare not say renouncement. But when asked to his Lord, I'll stay silent on Christ. And when I feel sin, I won't offer a fight. I'll just ease and give in. Walk away from it all, avoid every strife, preserve my one life. But it's only through strife that we learn what it means to endure. And when I endure, I build hope, strong and mature. And since I am in Christ, I can know that my hope is secure. And in this hope, I am assured. Every day has been stained by my failure, so what good is hope? His grace is sufficient, my sins have been cleaned The world has so much to offer, and I'll never know Then I'll set my mind on the things unseen I do not lose heart, less of me, God renews every part For what's laid up before me is full weight of glory And no one can take it, it's Christ who upholds me So though the outer self is wasting away the inner self renewed day by day This momentary affliction is light But I won't live by sight So I'll live by eternity's heights What is this suffering compared to the knowledge of heavenly glory? I do not lose heart I will not give up Hi everyone, my name is John and my wife Ellen and I, we help lead our San Diego church. Well, here we are in the last week of our message series next. We've covered the topics of being commissioned, being bold, getting equipped, and today I'm going to talk about perseverance. Now this topic made me think of those inspiring inventors who went through so many iterations and even failures, like Thomas Edison who went through a thousand light bulb attempts until he got that one to work, or the Wright brothers whom I recently read about and learned it took them almost four years before their first powered airplane in 1903. Not bad for two working class dreamers from Dayton, Ohio with no engineering education, no university laboratories or libraries, and no internet. We applaud such examples of perseverance and grit. Why? 
because we know it's hard to stick it out. And this ever important trait seems to be quite rare nowadays. Considering why, I thought it's because our modern life encourages us to expect instant gratification, immediate results, and effortless success. From microwave dinners to door dashing your favorite boba shop, it's all at our fingertips, like literally. So we've been bred to have this kind of expectation of life, and if we don't get it, then it's not surprising if we get a little irritated just for encountering the basic friction of life, like traffic. We might be inclined to wonder during such moments, why stick it out? Why bother? And in the words of sports philosopher Rocky Balboa, he says, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are, no one's gonna hit as hard as life. It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And I think it's no different when it comes to Christian life. We can be commissioned, equipped, and venture out there, but we need the perseverance and the grit to stick it out and endure. Now, going through the scripture, we can see that perseverance is a high value. And through the book of Acts, we see how this shaped many of the early Christians. They were hit hard by the world, and they didn't quit, but kept on moving forward. In particular, when we look at Apostle Paul's life, we see how much he had to endure. Of course, we must remember Apostle Paul was initially a persecutor of the church and was even a witness to the stoning of Stephen, there giving his approval. But then through encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus, he goes from a persecutor to a preacher to a planter. And starting in Acts 13, we see Paul and Barnabas being sent out by the Antioch church to proclaim the word and teach the forgiveness of sins of Jesus. Going from synagogue to synagogue, they basically began doing Bible studies and were causing quite a stir, like in the city of Antioch, Pisidia. Acts 13 tells us some Jews were opposed to their message. Verse 45 says, But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. However, Paul was not deterred, proclaiming more boldly to Jews and Gentiles, such that in verse 48 to 49, we see many were being saved. I'll read that for us. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. And this only further angered some of the Jews, who were then gathered and incited others against Apostle Paul. But even as Apostle Paul is run out of town and goes to Iconium, these Jews don't leave him alone, but continue to chase him down and find him there too. Where we read in 14, 5-6, an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them. They learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe. So Apostle Paul and Barnabas take off. And at Lystra, they end up healing a crippled man from birth. And the people there are amazed such that they start to worship Paul and Barnabas, calling them gods like Zeus and Hermes. Of course, Paul and Barnabas cry out and chastise them, but it's also a chance to preach the gospel about to them about the one true living God. But wait, remember those Jews? They're still in pursuit, and we find them there, and we read in 14 to 19, 14, 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So they rile up the crowds against Paul and have him stoned, leaving him for dead. I mean, you gotta stop after that, right? Threats on his life is one thing, but then they actually attempt to take him out. But what do we read happens next? Acts 14, 20 to 22 tells us, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Notice what it says in verse 22. He goes about strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. As Paul returns to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, the very cities that caused this upheaval that we read in verse 22, this battered and bruised apostle Paul does not arrive discouraged, seeking medical attention, but instead we see him preaching the gospel. And he has a discipleship retreat, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. So what's surprising about Paul's response? That at so many points, Paul could have given up, thrown in the towel, said, this is too much. I should just go back to tent making. It's an easier and safer job. 
But Apostle Paul is amazing in that not only does he keep on going, but he seems to get stronger with each obstacle. Like his superpower seems to be that the more he's persecuted and his life is endangered, instead of being weakened and discouraged, it has the opposite effect. And he gets stronger and more buoyant. We can see that there are many quitting points. But one thing is clear, is that because he didn't, people are saved and the disciples are strengthened. Now maybe you're thinking, okay, John, but I'm not Apostle Paul. And like, I totally get that because I know I'm not him either. So I agree, it can be hard to identify with such an impressive figure. Like clearly we're not him. So then what do we do? Just give up and say, forget about it? Like, I don't think that's the way Apostle Paul would see it. In fact, through his letters to Timothy, one of his closest and dearest disciples, we can get a picture of what Apostle Paul would say to us. Now consider what kind of person was Timothy? Actually, the description from the scriptures is that he was timid, like in 2 Timothy 1.7. Not the bold and fearless guy that we think Apostle Paul to be. And in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul asked the church there to not scare Timothy, saying, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. So what was Apostle Paul's message to Timothy? He didn't want to spare him a chance to endure. He was giving them this opportunity. So he tells them in 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 12, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He refers to those same cities where he experienced life-threatening persecutions, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. Timothy hadn't been with Apostle Paul through that first missionary journey through those cities. So Paul seems to be saying this to set the expectation of what lies ahead for not just Paul, but for Timothy. And as verse 12 says, for all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's you and me too. See, he invites Timothy knowing that through it all, the Lord rescued him, which enabled him to persevere. So it says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. What does this teach us? It's that perseverance is not about having a particular makeup or disposition. Even though Timothy was such a timid person, Apostle Paul still charged him. It was a call to join in suffering. Not because Paul is a masochist, but because perseverance is what Timothy will need in the face of inevitable difficulties and obstacles that he will face. So then we too have to choose to persevere. Otherwise, as the demands of reality increase, we will find it increasingly harder to continue what is, which is exactly the outcome that Satan would want, to get us out of the spiritual battle. So Paul further encourages Timothy, saying, I put this charge before you, Timothy, my child, in keeping with the prophecies once spoken about you, in order that with such encouragement you may fight the good fight to do this. You must hold firmly to faith and a good conscience which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck in regard to the faith. On the whole, it is Paul's exhortation to Timothy to persevere, to hang in there. It's not easy, but stand firm, fight the good fight. Now, I ask, why fight and why keep persevering? Because it seems like managing our own lives is a challenge in itself. With just the typical stresses that life brings, and especially now as we try to navigate and emerge from this pandemic, the fact is, life is just getting harder with a myriad of opportunities, each requiring the best of your efforts. And of course, we're trying to do this in this broken world. Now add to that, trying to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, that is, loving one another, doing ministry, all of which requires your time, resources, and will even lead you to be persecuted. Maybe not the physical kind that Apostle Paul experienced, but being met with resistance to the gospel message in your faith and the commitment to live that out. Then all the more, we will need the encouragement from Scripture and from one another to persevere. So Paul wants to dispel any notion that Christian life is simply about being comfortable and serene. And all of that makes sense, especially in the context of loving someone, right? Because loving someone, that's going to entail sacrifice, self-denial, a certain intensity in an effort to bless others. So the result is that Apostle Paul's care for people led him into places where he put himself in harm's way, even visiting the very areas where he had experienced intense 
opposition. We need to be careful that our vision of Christian life is properly calibrated and not against the picture of Christian life that has sadly come to characterize much of Christianity today, which is often a life that includes a smooth, frictionless life, manageable, and even health and wealth. But instead, we need to see life against the context here in Acts and Apostle Paul's life. Think about his life. Three missionary journeys traveling, some scholars say, over 10,000 miles while on the run from his life, from men plotting to kill him, debating with the Greeks at Mars Hill about an unknown God, or being imprisoned and flogged. I think 2 Corinthians 11 further captures and describes his life so well. It reads, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. That's a lot of danger. <laughs> and toil and hardship through many and sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. These were the physical dangers and suffering that he faced. But of course, there was also the burden on his heart for the churches, as verse 28 continues. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? His life was anything but tranquil, full of the hardships of life, but also the joy of winning people for the gospel. So we get it that if we have a proper biblical view of Christian life, then we understand we're not going to just experience success, health, and wealth, and life going swimmingly, but we're going to face opposition and threats. But by holding on, we will mature through this process. So first, we must hold on, as Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 1. You may fight the good fight. To do this, you must hold firmly to the faith in a good conscience. See, we can take solace in knowing as we persevere and fight the good fight by holding on to faith, how do we do that? Not looking for ways to escape or give up. And it's through this God is going to mature us. Like that song, Lord, this pathway may not be easy. I think there's phrases in there that really ring out so true. It says, Lord, don't let me be dissuaded from your holy work in me till I reach your destination and at last I'm home and free. Now, for those of you who might be going through some difficulties because of your faith, let's remember God is at work in you and working around us. And He will carry us through until we reach our final destination. And as it says in James 1, 2-4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So how can we bring this home for ourselves today? What does this mean for us, for us to hold on? I think there are many opportunities to build up our endurance muscles, but I was thinking about one, like in our relationships. You know, it's like when you first met your peers, your freshman year, and you're like, who is this guy? And can we ever get along? Man, I had a friend like that. We were the odd couple, and it was like water and oil. I like it cold, he likes it hot. Clean versus messy. I won't tell you who is who. There was no natural affinity or, or care for one another. Frankly, it was easier to just quit on that friendship instead of trying to work it out. But as we began to endure, we try to open up. We talk about our issues. See what it's like to be on the other side of one another and in each other's shoes. What happened? We grew closer. We matured as we learned to work through our differences. Enduring, persevering, getting past the quitting points. That's what helps us to mature, be sanctified. Our sinful habits start to fall off so that we can become like Apostle Paul, undaunted and able not to be deterred even when the circumstances become more challenging. Now finally, I think the hope from the work that Christ did on the cross gives us the fuel to endure. Our hope is in Christ who defeated death and was victorious when God raised him from the dead. Having this eternal perspective, it gives us the necessary emotional resources to carry on. It's this hope in Christ, this post-resurrection reality, that ultimately enables us to persevere. Knowing that Christ has overcome death, achieved for us victory through the cross, now this knowledge transforms our present reality. We can move from this long-suffering slog to a hope-filled striving. And how? Well, let's think about this example. 
It's like the US invasion of Normandy in World War II. When the US and its allies invaded France on D-Day, the leaders knew it was all over for Hitler. With the Russian juggernaut hammering from the east, and now the Allied forces descending and coming in from the west, Hitler's only possible future was absolute defeat. But for the soldiers on the ground, it didn't feel like anything was over. Bitter battles lay ahead, and many would still need to keep fighting. And I think this is a partial analogy for our situation today. For Christians living in the post-resurrection life, Jesus, he's won the decisive battle at the cross through his death and resurrection. We've won. Sin is destroyed. Reconciliation is accomplished. Eternity is real. But spiritual life is hard, and we get more consumed often by our day-to-day -day living and just getting through it that we just forget. We forget that there's a greater reality. There's something way better at the end that's motivating us. There's a reality that we have the hope of heaven. Jesus has won the victory. And when we remember, when we remember that, we can look beyond our present circumstances. Jesus won. So we have to hold on. We have to persevere and keep fighting. Victory is assured, but we still need to fight and work hard. We need to band together with my fellow brothers and sisters to hold off the enemy. And lastly, we see that these soldiers, they did it together, right? And I think that's a fitting end to this picture of suffering because we do this together as the church. Just like you're not meant to go to war alone, we're not meant to live this life and fight alone. We have the church. So let's commit then to spurring one another on by not giving up meeting together, praying for it, sharing scripture together. And in this way, we can persevere together. You know, when Joe started our message series, it was that we were commissioned. Not one of us, but all of us. The invitation that we have, that Apostle Paul gave to Timothy, he gives to us, to you and to me, and that's to join him. It's a partnership that we can do this together. And he says, join me in suffering for the sake of the gospel. So let's pray together. I just want to give us a few moments to think and pray for ourselves. I want to ask, what are some things that you're having difficulty enduring? Well, maybe there's a chance to pray to God for His strength during this time to buoy you. Or are you feeling disheartened and beaten down? Are there strongholds you need help with or sins you're struggling with? Well, let's pray and come back and repent and find hope in the Lord. Or maybe there are areas you need help maturing in. Well, let's bring those areas to God in prayer. So let's pray together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and the example that we have through people like Apostle Paul who have gone ahead of us, who have suffered and endured. And Lord, they are an example for us of what it looks like to persevere through struggles and through life and our sins and gives us hope, Father, and especially with the hope of the cross of Jesus that we are not left on our, to our own devices, but that together we can persevere with the hope that the cross gives to us as well as to know that this perseverance is going to mature and to shape us and to change us. And Father, please help us to not give up, to not quit, to not throw in the towel, but to keep holding on. We thank you so much for this time and for your message and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where heaven's blind creations is pride and Careful hands they hold us safe within his 
for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our message series. And on behalf of all of us here in San Diego, we hope you have a great week. Bye.
that guy that's a plan That's the story of my life, right? God, that's a plan You know that guy that's a plan That's the story of my life, right? God, that's a plan There's a lot of stuff we want, but what we want, is it what we need? How can we know? What if the good life isn't what we expect? Join us for a four-part series about what God wants to give us so we can live our best lives. It's what we need.